Bill Harwood is also joining us, CBS News Space consultant. Bill, um, picking up on Mark's point, um, uh, it, 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 given that there was there were delays in getting the, the Boeing Starliner up in the first place, then of course we know about the extended stay. Evaluate the return. It feels like, and as you know, I know very little. It feels like this has been quite a routine return, without any bumps. It, yeah, John, it's it's been by the book uh, from the moment they undocked very early this morning. All the way through to this point where they just told the crew to brace for splashdown they it's just gone i don't think it could have gone any better i mean this is how they write them up in the in the press kits and so now uh, what's the next uh what's the next step for them after this rehabilitation physical therapy you know when you spend this long in the absence of gravity it takes quite a bit of time as as your guest can uh, describe, to get your body back and get your land legs back, and if you will. Down. They're going to fly the crew. Hold on, just let's listen there in. There we go. And SpaceX Freedom, splashdown. Good main release. Copy, splashdown. We see main shoots cut. Nick, Alex, Butch, Sunny. On behalf of SpaceX, welcome home. It is, uh, it is an amazing thing. What a ride. I see a capsule full of grins ear to ear. We're listening to Commander Nick Haig there. Just listen in a second if he has more to say. All right, we're going to stand by in and case. And as oh. you can see on your screen, we have visual confirmation of splashdown. <laughs> Dragon Freedom has returned home, and NASA astronauts. System safety verifications are in progress. We'll report back when recovery uh. personnel are in route. All right, well, uh, we're going to report back with, with you, Dr. Marshburn. So, what's that like? Oh, that's uh, wonderful. The seats are well designed, they're custom made for or custom fit for each crew member. And so what they felt when they were going about 20 miles an hour when they hit the water, what they felt was just a, a pretty strong impact, but it's over very quickly. And it's a bit of a non-event. They prepared by crossing their arms over their chest and then it's over. Now they're just bobbing around and experiencing this weird thing called gravity. Right. And so about how long do you think, I mean, I guess every, time, every uh, instance is different, but how long is the wait there before the taxi arrives? Uh, typically around, in, in, between 20 and 40 minutes, so uh, you know, they're really good at determining where it's going to land and so they can have their ship ready to come over. There's going to be a ship that comes up. It's got medical personnel, others to bring that uh, spacecraft up onto the ship and then extract the astronauts. And as an astronaut, is there a self-diagnostic process that starts the minute this happens, which is, okay, what am I going to report to the medical officials that come to tell them how I'm checking in with my various parts of the body? Oh, sure. Because everybody's different, especially Sasha, the Russian cosmonaut. He's never been in space before. He has no idea what he's going to feel. Uh, so you never know. Uh, some people, about one in five, feel pretty sick actually, uh, but it's everybody's a little bit different. And so they'll be uh, they'll be checked out. So what? Ha so they go. Uh, there they'll be checked out basically right away. Yes. Oh yeah. As a matter of fact, once they get on the ship, or the first checkout was hearing Nick's voice, which is always a great thing to hear. And the fact he said there's grins all around. That's the first check. They'll bring them up on the ship, the hatch will open, and you'll actually see the flight surgeon stick his head in or her head in and actually point to each crew member and ask them exactly how are you feeling. And are they good for, number one, having a camera come in, and number two, uh, starting to pull them out. And I know there's a protocol for everything. Yep. Uh, even doing an interview with Sonny, I loved going through the, the dance steps required to yep. actually start communicating. Is there, are there a specific set of steps in terms of that diagnostic, you know, ask a specific question, seek a specific response? Absolutely. I was an ER doc before I uh, became an astronaut. And so uh, typically that flight surgeon, at least in my experience, has been an ER doc. And they just come right in and they've got their whole, they can do an entire neurologic and neuromuscular exam just in like 30 seconds. And what does it feel like, uh, you know, we talked about they're, they're getting used to gravity again after a period of time. I mean, are they, uh, do they walk? or are they lifted out or how so what we'll see is uh, they'll actually be uh, they're able to unstrap they're able to get out of their seat and onto a ramp and slide onto a gurney uh -huh. and be rolled over to the med bay you'll see them you'll see that whole process 
Uh, even if an astronaut's feeling good and wants to stand up, we usually ask them to not do that because you never know until you stand up how you're going to feel, might fall over. But sometimes uh, astronauts get really excited and they just want to hop out and say hi. But we'll see. They'll well, probably end up in the gurneys. And who can, who can blame them? Let's yeah. go back to, uh, yeah. to Mark Strassman. Uh, Mark, uh, so pick it up from here. What does the rest of the journey uh, look like for uh, Butch and Sonny in particular? But you can give us the, the rundown for anybody you'd like. Yeah, sure. Uh, hoist out the capsule uh, onto the recovery ship. Uh, from there, there are, as uh, you guys were talking about, they're, they're examined uh, by doctors to make sure everybody's doing okay. They'll be helicoptered to the uh, Florida uh, Panhandle, and from there, they're taken by NASA jet uh, to Ellington Field uh, here in Houston, about uh, 10 miles from where I'm standing, uh, where their uh, families will be waiting for them, where their families, in a sense, have been waiting for them for the last nine months. And then the adjustment period begins, right? I mean, we talked about the physical adjustment. And then for these two in particular, there's going to be another kind of adjustment, which is all the attention that they're going to get. I mean, it's unlike any astronaut really in recent memory. People want to hear from them how they did it, where they found the resilience to go on, uh, what makes this such an extraordinary trip in their minds. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's going to be very, very interesting to see how they adjust uh, physically and otherwise to being back on Earth. That's right. I think you and I alone probably have about, uh, and add Bill in there, it's about 100 questions. Uh, I hope they're ready. Let me go back to Bill Harwood. Bill, remind us again about, to me, this is such an amazing story of adaptation, uh, you know, when you're thrown a curveball. Um, just tell us the story a little bit. Uh, you know, they went up there for a limited mission and then, they had to pivot. Um, remind everybody about the, the story and also what happened after they pivoted uh, during that long period of, of being up at the ISS. Yeah, you know, they expected a mission lasting eight to 10 days. And as you've discussed, you know, they ran into those problems with the Boeing Starliner. NASA ultimately decided it would be less impact on the space station on, in terms of the science and the crew <laughs> rotation schedule to keep them in orbit until they could come home on this Crew Dragon. And you know, John, one of the interesting things about this flight, uh, the crew has spent 286 days in orbit for this extended mission. And that sounds like a lot. It's, it's longer than a normal mission. But the record is held by NASA astronaut Frank Rubio. He spent 371 days, more than a year in space, because the Russian spacecraft that launched him ran into problems. The Russians had to replace the spacecraft, just like what's happened here with the Starliner astronauts. And as a result, his six-month mission was extended to just over a full year. So this has happened before to a NASA astronaut, but it's the first time it's happened uh, with an American spacecraft like this. But it, it's certainly an interesting thing to take into consideration how history repeats itself sometimes. Indeed. And also that uh, a good reminder that, um, in, in a sense, all astronauts know what they signed up for. In other words, um, it, it, you know, adaptation is the name of the game. Bill, remind us all again, because I, I, I think we could all use uh, the reminder that, that, that the ride home was always there for them. Um, explain uh, why they didn't just take it and, and buzz home when, uh, when they heard there was going to be a delay. Yeah, you know, this Starliner has been docked at, Starliner, this Crew Dragon has been docked at the station since uh, last September. So, yes, they could have come down earlier, but if they had done that, all four have to come down at the same time. That would have left one astronaut aboard the space station, Don Pettit, to operate all of the myriad systems in the U.S. segment, uh, you know, handle research, which would virtually grind to a stop. And you wouldn't be able to do spacewalks for an emergency with just one crew member right. available. So it just made more sense to keep the crew up until they could come down on this flight. It'll get the crew rotation schedule back on track, and it minimizes the disruption to the research they carry out on board the station. And we're going to turn back. Thank you, Bill. And we're going to turn back now to uh, Tom, Dr. Tom Marshburn, who has uh, been inside of one of those uh, capsules. Doctor, what were they just doing in that uh, fishing boat there on the outside? Well, the uh, spacecraft uh, is clustered with small rockets, uh, which are some propellant that can be toxic. And so basically they're coming up and just making sure the air around the capsule is safe, that others can get close to them. They have sensors, so they're inspecting the outside. 
Uh, it's interesting from the crew's perspective, the windows have burned over through re-entry. You might get a glow through the windows, but they can't really see what's happening. But they can hear things. They can hear an engine motor. They can hear clunking on the outside. And that's, that's actually really nice to hear. <laughs> Sounds of earth, a little water sloshing. Um, and so, yeah, Earth is a good place, and it's good to be back. Sounds. You, uh, when you're in space, there, you, it's less cacophonous, right? What is it like to the ears to hear the sounds of Earth again? Oh, it's, it's wonderful. So they, they're not getting the full breadth of it yet, but they will. Uh, I can tell you for, from experience for the next weeks, months, and maybe years, sound of wind, the sound of rain on a roof or on your face, uh, the feel of sand under your feet, and all those things, you learn to appreciate all those little things. Is there a recommended regimen when you come back, you know, to take advantage of an extraordinarily unique perspective on hearing, sight, smell? Um, is there, or is it every astronaut does it differently? Oh, probably, uh, well, as you mentioned, we go through a regimen. And from a medical standpoint, has there been an impact on any of those senses? Uh, our hearing, the space station's fairly loud. There's always fans going because you have to keep the air moving up there, um, eyesight can be affected, et cetera. So we're, after all those medical tests, then each astronaut is just gonna be doing what they need to do to recover. Usually that's being at home, getting reacquainted with family and friends, taking it pretty easy because their recovery back to being able to, you know, they're both athletes, or all four are athletes. Getting back to be an athlete could take months. Right. So they're working on that. I'm gonna come back to you in a moment, Doctor. We'll go, let's go back to uh, Mark Strassman, uh, who's covering this. Um, Mark? Well, speaking of the sounds uh, that uh, they they m will be hearing now, the, I can tell you the sounds from here, uh, from the NASA building behind me, screams of delight when the uh, splashdown happened. People relieved, of course, that uh, Butch and Sonny have made it back home. Uh, this is a an interesting. Uh, moment and mission for a lot of reasons, as we all know. Headlines followed the astronauts for the last nine months, stranded in space, abandoned in space. I think it's important to point out that the astronauts have each told us over the last few months, they don't feel that way at all. They haven't felt that way, that they've enjoyed their extra time in space, that, that essentially this is their sweet spot, their opportunity to go to space, because not only because they, they want to live in the moment of space, but also because they don't know if they'll have that opportunity again. And so for Butch and Sonny, I think, yes, it's important to come home. Yes, they want to reconnect with their families, obviously. But they have enjoyed their nine months in space, and, and that's, that's worth mentioning, too. What a great point. Mark, um, to the, anyone who would think that they are unlucky, they are actually extra lucky to live a life under a sense of mission like that, where you're, where you're thrilled to get this, uh, this extra set of, uh, this, these extra sets of days. Speaking of a, of a life where you have a sense of mission, give me a sense of the psychological return to um, Earth and the perspective you bring back from looking at a planet where there are no borders, uh, where it looks maybe thin and fragile. Um, how, how, what was that like? Oh, wait, well, you summed it up pretty well, actually. Um, learn, I think all of us learn to appreciate the little things that every single day the Earth brings and, and our personal contacts with people. So at a very local level, you appreciate that so much more. And yes, we do have a desire for heads of state to all see this, because to your point, atmosphere is very thin. Uh, the Earth is incredibly beautiful, but you know we're just living on the skin of the Earth, and we're very fragile. We as, uh, as just life in general, but us as a species. Right. Sure. That's so well put.